Right, I'm going to look at touch voltage today. And we've got quite a lot to cover here. How to calculate touch voltage and fault current. We've got the voltage factors, C max and C min. We're going to look at the voltage which will actually appear at the fault. And we're going to look at touch voltage for an installation with and without protective bonding and with supplementary protective bonding. And also, is main bonding actually effective? So quite a bit of ground to cover. So what is touch voltage? It's a voltage that will appear between simultaneously accessible conductive parts during a fault. So that's between exposed and extraneous conductive parts or between a conductive part and earth. Generally, we want to keep any touch voltage below 50 volts. BS7671 has no specific reference to touch voltage, but it does have this reg here. The resistance between simultaneously accessible exposed conductive parts and extraneous conductive parts shall fulfill the following condition. Resistance is less than 50 volts divided by IA. IA is the operating current of a protected device. This is often used in special locations. We're basically checking that the resistance of the circuit will not slow down disconnection times and any voltage that will appear is supposed to be less than 50 volts. It's really more to do with time though than voltage. Time is the crucial thing. We really need that protected device to operate as quickly as possible. 0.4 of a second for TN systems, 0.2 of a second for TT systems, but ideally we want it to operate instantaneously, less than 0.1 of a second, because it's time that's really important in limiting the effects of current on a person. It seems the body can stand a little bit more current for a very short time. We want it to trip up within half a heartbeat, so we don't disrupt the heart's rhythm. Magnitude will of course have some effect as well. In this example here, there's been a breakdown of the element in the kettle. The line conductor has come into contact with the metal case of the kettle. So a voltage will appear on that. And as you know, to receive a shock, you have to have a potential difference. Now the magnitude of that shock depends what else you're touching as well. You could be touching the kitchen tap and touching the kettle. We need to calculate the touch voltage that will happen there. Our primary protective measure is automatic disconnection of the supply. And for that to be effective, we need protective earthing, such as our CPCs, which will clear the fault in a very, very short time. We have our protective equipotential bonding, which will limit the voltage that will appear, the touch voltage. So our thing of time and touch. So in this example, we have a TNCS earthing system into our protective earth and neutral are combined on the supply side and separated at the installation. And so when we're calculating touch voltage, we need to know the supply voltage. We need to calculate the fault current. And we also need to know the resistance of the various conductors throughout the circuit. This is our earth fault loop impedance path from the fault back to the transformer. During a fault, current will flow through the CPC, through the MET, through the pen conductor back to the transformer, through the transformer, back on the supply line conductor, and this is when the protected device will operate. We want this fault path to have as little impedance as possible, because that will mean we'll have a high fault current, and we need high fault currents for fast disconnection times. There's our protective bonding conductor, and that is limiting any voltages that will appear on the extraneous conductive parts. So let's start with the voltage and voltage factors. We have two voltage factors, C min and C max. C min 0.95 and C max 1.1. Now these are multipliers. We times the voltage by these amounts and that will either increase or decrease the voltage that we use in our calculations. Now when we're calculating our disconnection times, it's recommended we use C min. The reason being is, to operate the protected device in the required time, we need a high fault current. If the resistance is constant and the voltage drops, the current will also drop. 
This will lead to longer disconnection times. So we factor in worst case by using C min to lower the voltage. And here's an example here. We're calculating our ZS. Our ZS has to be less than C min times UO divided by IA. So we'll times 230 volts by 0.95 and that will give us 218.5 volts. We divide that by the current that causes operation of the protective device, IA. In this case, it's um, 100 amps, BS7671 Appendix 3, 20 amp MCB, RCBO, five times its rated current would be 100 amps. So this would be a 20 amp protective device here. So we divide 218.5 by 100, and we get 2.19 ohms. This is the maximum earth fault loop impedance that's allowed in BS7671. And C max. This is recommended when we're estimating the maximum protective fault currents and the maximum perspective touch voltages. If you want to know the maximum current that will flow, we need to apply C max, which will adjust the voltage to the higher range. More voltage, more current. So 1.1 times 230 is 253 volts. We divide that by whatever the ZS is for that circuit. In this case, it's 1.35 ohms. And that'll give us a fault current of 187 amps. Good. So we know our voltage and we've got our fault current. So now we can work out what our touch voltage is. The formula for touch voltage for a TNCS system. You get a different formula for TNS, TNCS, TT. This is TNCS. So our touch voltage is our fault current times the impedance of the supply pen conductor and of this circuit protective conductor. This is touch voltage if there's no main bonding in place. If there is main bonding in place, the formula would be UT equals the fault current times R2. Right, so Z pen, that is the impedance of our pen conductor. The return path from the cutout to the transformer. And our R2, that's the impedance or the resistance of our circuit protective conductor. This will be the resistance of the CPC from the kettle to the main earthing terminal. The other resistances are impedances. Impedance is an AC term. Impedance is when there's AC current flowing through a conductor. Resistance is a measurement you would do, say, with your multifunction tester. You'd do a DC test. That'll give you resistance. Impedance is when there's AC current in the circuit. So the other important resistances we need to know is our R1. That's the impedance of our line conductor. That'll be from the MCB to the kettle and the external supply. That's our Z1 in this case. So we have a ZD of 0.35 and we're presuming that the protective conductor and the line conductor are both the same cross-sectional area, the same size. They both have the same impedance, 0.175 ohms. Add them together, you get a ZD, our external path of 0.35 ohms, which is the maximum for the TNCS. I'd just like to go off on a little bit of a tangent here and discuss fault drop. So we're talking about the voltage that will actually appear at the fault. People often think, well, it's 230 volts, it'll be 230 volts at the fault. That's rarely the case in TN systems. That's quite probable in TT systems. So this is very simplified, and it's all based on Ohm's law in volt drop. There will be an impedance within the cable in the circuit. And as voltage travels through a resistor, it drops some of its voltage. So therefore, when it gets to the fault, there will be some volt drop. Normally when we're calculating our volt drop, it's quite tiny amounts. But remember, we've got a high fault current, so we're going to get a larger volt drop. So our volt drop is the fault current times the resistance, basic Ohm's law. In the external line, Z1, we have an impedance of 0.175 ohms. And the impedance in that leg will drop 33 volts, which will leave 220 volts. Remember, this is very simplified. And then from the MCB, we have the R1 to the kettle, and that's got an impedance, a resistance of 0.5 ohms. And that's going to drop 94 volts, 
which will leave 126 volts at the kettle. So the voltage at the kettle will be 126 volts. Basically, if the line and protective conductors are the same cross-sectional area and the same length, the voltage at the fault will be roughly half the supply voltage because of volt drop. Generally, though, when we're doing our touch voltage calculations, we use the protective conductors. Protective conductors can have a reduced cross-sectional area compared to the line conductors. So you'll notice in the formulas, we're using the R2 and the Z pen, but we do use the R1 and the Z1 when we're calculating our ZS. So here is that circuit simplified. And you can see if you split the leg into two halves, the R1 and the R2s, and each leg we're dropping about 127 volts. Times that by two, you get around 253 volts. Total resistance is 1.35 ohms. You times that by the fault current, 187 amps. And that gives you 253 volts. Now here's the touch voltage formula for when we have bonding in place. UT equals IF times R2. And it tells us that our touch voltage will be 93.5 volts. Now we had 126 volts at the kettle. And then on the leg from the kettle to the met, we've dropped 94 volts, which will leave 33 volts on the met. So our met is at 33 volts above true earth. Now the main protective bonding is connected to that met. We have 126 volts on the kettle. And because the tap is connected to the main earthing terminal with equipotential bonding, that will raise the potential of the tap as well to 33 volts. 126 volts minus the 33 volts will give us a touch voltage of 93 volts. Here you can compare the two scenarios with bonding in place and with no bonding. So with bonding in place, we just use the fault current times the R2. And with no bonding in place, it's the fault current times R2 and Z pen. With bonding, we get a touch voltage of 93 volts. And with no bonding, we get that half the supply voltage, don't we? We've got the 126 volts appearing at the kettle. And we're presuming the extraneous conductive part, the tap, will be at earth potential, zero volts. So therefore, we'll have a potential difference of 126 volts. You'll notice, though, that both are above 50 volts. We have this notion that we have to keep voltage below 50 volts. To my mind, that rarely happens. Unless, of course, you've got supplementary protective bonding. It all gets quite complicated, and this is very, very simplified. So let's have a look what happens if we do add supplementary bonding. I know that supplementary bonding has gone out of fashion because of RCDs. So, so here we are. We've got a special location, the bathroom. And we've got an electric towel rail. And we've got a tap. The supplementary bond will have a very low resistance because it's generally only a very short distance. But because of the addition of the supplementary bonding, we now need to recalculate our ZS. The ZS of the circuit will be reduced and the fault current will increase. So our formula for ZS is ZE plus R1 plus R2. We have some resistors in parallel here. So our R2 becomes a little bit more complex. Our R2 was 0.5. Supplementary bond is 0.05. From resistors in parallel, and we get a value of 0.05. And we have to add that to our R1, which is 0.5. 0.5 plus 0.05 equals 0.55. We have to add our ZE, which is 0 0.35. 0 0.35 plus 0.55 equals 0 0.9. So as you can see, our ZS has been reduced. We do our fault current calculation. IF equals C max times UO divided by ZS. So that will be 253 divided by 0.9. Gives our new fault current of 281 amps. But this is a parallel circuit. So the current is not going to be constant, is it? The current will be shared a little bit. The majority of the fault current will flow via the supplementary bonding because it's a lower resistance path. But some will still flow through the R2. And this is where we get into a bit of guesstimate. Dodgy maths alert. So I'm going to use 250 amps for the current flowing through the supplementary bonding. 
So 250 times 0.05 equals 12.5 volts. So our touch voltage has come down to 12.5 volts because of the addition of supplementary protective bonding. And the exposed and extraneous conductive parts are joined together. The potentials are almost equal. We haven't got a large volt drop. RCDs have taken over from supplementary protective bonding, but you can see the benefit of it. I've put this on at the end because I think it's quite interesting. It comes from a book, Touch Voltages in Electrical Installations by Brian Jenkins. Very good book. And it mentions the benefits of main protective bonding and how they can appear to be quite minimal in certain circumstances. For fault conditions arising in the installation, more beneficial when faults arise external to the installation, maybe thinking of diverted neutral currents and such. If you want to just pause this and have a read through. I've got another video coming up shortly on main protective bonding in TT installations. And that situation is very different. Main protective bonding can have a significant effect on reducing touch voltages. So that's just something to think about. That's it for this one. I hope it's been some use. And as always, thanks for watching.